So, you're all hanging in there. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Gina Tortulius, a PhD student at Leiden University Institute for Area Studies in the Netherlands. His dissertation is on oral tradition regarding current conflicts over ancestral lands in the Mentawai Islands. He earned, he earned his advanced masters at the Research School for Asian, African, and Amer Indian Studies at Leiden University and a bachelor's degree in social and cultural anthropology from Andalas University of West Sumatra in Indonesia. He has worked as a researcher at the Leiden Institute of Area Studies as a social, educational, and cultural advisor for the Sumatran Plate Boundary Project of the California Institute of Technology in collaboration with the Indonesian Institute of Sciences and as a field consultant for UNESCO in their Jakarta office. His field work includes the study of land rights and land conflict among the Mentawaiians, documenting oral traditions concerning the early migrations of the Mentawaiians, research on the knowledge of Mentawai healers and medicinal plants, and research on natural resource and sustainable management for UNESCO on Sebrut Island. He has also served as a Mentawai to English translator and as an anthropological and ethnographic advisor for several documentary film projects in the United States and the United Kingdom. He was awarded as the Young Scientist and Environmentalist by Man and Biosphere Program of the UNESCO Jakarta Office. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I'm very happy to be here to share my knowledge with you. Um, today, I would like to tell you something about the Mentawai material culture, a small ethnic group living on one of the outer islands in Indonesia. I will discuss briefly various aspects of mental and material culture, and I will discuss the issue of authenticity of the mental and artifacts as soon as these objects labeled as tribal art became subject to the national and international art market. Let's see first um, how we get close to Mentawai. The Mentawai archipelago is part of an island chain located in the Indian Ocean, some 100 kilometers west of West Sumatra. The archipelago consists of four islands. Um, in the northern part, that is Sibirut. In the middle is Sipora. In the southern part is uh, North and South Pagai. All four Mentawai Islands have originally been covered with rainforest, but logging cleared almost all four islands, and the islands of Seaboard has been able to preserve some of its forests and main, maintain some of its traditional flavor. The Mentawai Islands form a political independence district since 1999, and the processes of social cultural modernization have taken a flight since then. The Mentawai Islands are inhabited by some 70 thousand people, and 20% of their total population consists of migrants from Sumatra, Jaffa, and other um, islands of Indonesia. The major of the Mentawaiians nowadays live in modern villages, offering facilities like road, 
churches, mosques, school, medical centers, and sometimes electricity and running water. Despite the processes of rapid change, a small number of Mentawayan living in the interior of Seabrook Island is still living in the traditional forest-based lifestyle. The traditional forest-based lifestyle of the Mentawayans is closely connected to a cosmological system based on the belief of a spirited world. Mentawayan material culture is largely determined by this local religion called Arat Sabulungan. The Mentawayan medicine and man, called Kere, are the most representative of Arat Sabulungan. Now we are going to look at a little bit close about Mentawai material culture. And it's a history from 1990s, sorry, from 1900. I will try to go through that until it's, uh, it's now. The Mentawai material culture has been under pressure ever since Dutch colonial occupation. The Dutch, negatively triggered by the savage nature of the Mentawayans, have abolished the headhunting practices of the Mentawayan in the early 20th centuries. As a result, most of the gear associated with headhunting became useless and slowly disappeared. The Dutch also Christianized the Mentawayan by invited um, German missionaries especially the Protestant missionaries, has been quite harsh on the Mentawayan. So what's happened? Mentawayan medicine men were outlawed. Their equipment was confiscated, and ritual objects were burned. After Indonesian independence in 1945, Indonesian post-colonial government was again negatively triggered by the backwardness of the Mentawayans. The Indonesian authorities tried to force the Mentawayan out of the forest and into the village and altered most of every aspect of their daily life. The most Mentawayans are part of the global world we live in. Therefore, they are, just, they are subject to various modernization processes. They nowadays live in the concrete houses, wear blue jeans, and use mobile phones, etc., etc. Let's try to look at it closely about the traditional life. Traditional Mentawai material culture is made out of natural materials found locally, such as wood, rattan, bark, bamboo, and animal products like feather, skin, skulls, and horn. The Mentawayan have no waving and iron tradition. Such objects, for instance, machetes, are therefore not part of the Mentawayan stylistic heritage. However, some of those objects adjust to the Mentawayan culture by adding particular style, like handle of the machete of dagger, and make it as close as possible as Mentawayan um, ownership. One of the most eye-catching Expression of Mentawai and material culture are the elevated long houses called Uma. So we, call, we can see those two, two examples. The Uma is the ultimate reflection of the tremendous carving and building skills of the Mentawayan. Most of these Mentawai objects are stored in the house. So now we are going to evaluate the ritual objects. The Mentawayan have countless ritual and ceremonial objects. The production as well as the use of these objects is surrounded by various taboos. I give you two examples. The first example is that of the Jorai. We can look at that um, 
um, left also right uh, below. Um, the mental way make two different kind of jarai. One jarai is made for the uma, for the longhouse, and the other is for the large canoe. The jarai is a wooden protective fetish panel. They are different in shape and ornaments. The jarai is, is protecting against harmful spirit and teasing the good spirits to stay in the house or in the canoe. The jarai is made by an elder man who is able to accomplish the taboo during the process of making it. As a design, the jaraik is painted on the medicine boxes and of the shaman and on shield used in a head hunting rate is also found as a tattoo on the human body. The second example is about the ceremonial pedals. You look at in the in the other side. These pedals are made for a wedding. The wood used for this pedal should be harvested during a moonless period because this wood has a tendency to crack if it is, it is harvested during the full moon. A set of pedals are made by the groom with the greatest attention because they serve a proof for his carving skills. These pedals are used only once to collect the bride from her father's house. After the wedding, the pedals are stored above the fireplace. This is how these pedals, after years storing, obtain their shiny brown color. Besides ritual objects, we also have objects for daily use. Objects for daily use are made by both men and women. Objects for daily use are sometimes also subject to taboos. Objects for daily use represent an identity of people living in a particular valley where the objects are used. The Mentawain easily distinguish a pedal that is usually used in the valley of Tailele, for instance, from a pedal that is used in the valley of Simatalu. Objects for a daily use are also represent the identity of individuals who have made them. I will give you a special I will give a special ornament on my own pedal in order to distinguish it from the pedal made by my cousin. When a mentawan became well known as a skilled carver, the community can easily recognize who the carver is. Besides daily use objects, we also have objects for fun and education. Objects made for fun and education consist of carvings and paintings depicting animals like monkeys, birds, lizards, snakes, and turtle. Due to the absence of a written tradition, the Mentawain use carvings and paintings in order to preserve their knowledge and their memory of certain historical events. These objects do not only ventilate the skills and imagination of the Mentawain carver, but also function as a tool to memorize local tales and folk tales. The arrival of outsiders, mostly tourists, encouraged the Mentawain to produce different things. Many Mentawains are involved in the production of objects sold to tourists that visit the islands. Tourists wish to buy pedals, bracelet, drum, hunting gear, tobacco, tobacco containers made out of coconut shell. Product bought by tourists must be small and easy to bring on their return flights. Therefore, many Mentawaiians have accommodated this request by producing smaller versions of their original products. The southern Mentawai Islands are known for the surfing industries. If you Google on internet, Mentawai, you immediately get tourist uh, business. If you like to surf on Mentawai, then you get that kind of information. 
the local production in a village called Katiet started to produce and sell products that are appropriate for this type of tourists, like wooden masts, synthetically colored fish carvings, small wooden surfboard decorated with dragons, and hunting spear with dramatized spear points. Like airport art, this product holds little to no connection to the Mentawai material culture. Perhaps you cannot see, but I can read in the top of the arrow, it said RP 10 million. That means 10 million rupees. It's about a thousand dollar. Uh, we cannot read it, but I can, uh, I can, let, uh, can show you in, uh, in a close place. Um, Mentawain are aware of the potential values of their material culture, but they are not always willing to sell their precious items. They therefore started to producing copies on demand. The materials used for these copies, as well as their the size, shape, and decoration, are similar to the originals. These copies are, however, never used in any ritual context. These copies often end up on the national and international type of art where they are subject to reselling. The reselling causes a values increase, money that is unfortunately not staying in or returned to the hands of the producer of these objects. So we try to identify who are those people who came to Mentawai to collect things. Private collector are informed in private collector are informed visitor and researcher working on Mentawai Islands. They collect items of Mentawai material culture that seems interesting to them on a personal basis. These items are not bought with the intention to resell them on any art market, but sometimes happens. International art dealers are seldom seen on Mentawai Islands. They buy items from Indonesian collectors and traders from Sumatra, Java, and Bali. These Indonesian collectors and traders work together with a local network consisting of both Indo Mentawaiians and a number of migrants living on Mentawai Islands. These local networks search the island for genuine objects and encourage the local people to produce items on demand. While genuine supplies are diminished and the produce on demand is often not satisfactory, mostly quality is often mentioned as a problem, some of the migrants have become involved in the process of production of Mentawan objects themselves. They often produce formalized items, they often produce formalized items and sometimes add symbols and details to their own taste. Besides those people, we also have collectors and traders are in search of genuine objects, which means that the object should be made by a Mentawayan, have been used for ritual purposes, be made out of local materials, and ventilate the Mentawayan cultural identity. Items should be, pre pre items should be old often measured by the black color and traces of use. Items are considered more valuable when they are look dramatic. Larger pieces and pieces that ventilate a certain air of mysticism are considered more valuable. Furthermore, our rare and disappearing objects are highly searched items. The market for Mentawan artifact is rather misty. With the involvement of non mentawan producer, the market is polluted already at the level of production. 
As soon as Mentawan artifact leave the Mentawan island, producers have little to no influence on the objects anymore. I tend, tend to travel through Sumatra, Java, and Bali, eventually ending up in the collection and museum all over the world. During their travel within the outside Indonesia, object, object became subject to alteration and improvement that make the objects more attractive to potential buyers and will upgrade its value. So what's happened? Objects are repaid then broken when it's broken or incomplete. Objects artificially blackened with shoe polish to make it look older. Wax to make it look shiny. Details are added, often skulls, to make it look more dramatic. Sometimes they dumped it in the swampy area. Sometimes they soak it in um, using um, mangrove bark to make it look like brownie. And then they smoke it days and days and days after they put it on the sun to put it on dry. Sometimes they just dumped it on the ground to let it um, by raining as uh, sun, it will be, the color will be changed. Information about history, place of origin, it maker, and original purpose of the objects is often lost, and as a result, became subject to speculation and false assumptions. Needless to say that this Ruthless capitalism, capitalizing on Mentawan culture by outsider is simply bypassing the interest of the Mentawayans. And more important is it is violating the stylistic heritage of the Mentawayans. We are discussing about authenticity. In principle, every object is authentic as long as he is not as long as it has not been manipulated with the intention of having it appear as something it is not. In this sense, even the serial tourist art from Katiet in the area where is the surfing industry located is also authentic if it is recognizable as such. In tribal art, the ascription of authenticity includes the assumption that the object should ventilate an ancient artistic tradition. The value attributed to tribal art stands and falls by this assumption. In an artifact that in the first instance had been highly esteemed as a being an authentic specimen, later to be found to be of the recent and manipulated origin, it should be called fake and its various appreciation and values are then suddenly diminished. We are now trying to conclude what I just um, said. The tribal art threat causes artifacts to become subject to a process of metamorphosis. When uh, objects are lifted out of the cultural context in which they are produced, and redefined as art in other cultural contexts, the metaphors and symbolisms they represent are unlikely to maintain their integrity. In order to, diminish, in order to minimize this loss of genuineness, which is unavoidably taking place when the objects are crossing cultural boundaries, art dealers, collectors, and museums should oblige themselves to conduct proper, proper research concerning the object under consideration. Only when proper research is conducted, the international art market will be able to limit, it, to limit the distortion of stylistic heritage of the Mentawayan or any indigenous culture to an absolute minimum. In my opinion, this is the only way to come to a fair an objective representation of this particular culture. Thank you. <laughs>